Welcome to our webinar on summer internship income opportunities during COVID-19. Um, today, we're gonna discuss and share some approaches and tools that can help our students think entrepreneurially about creating value in the market, the community, and even their own lives. So that's me, I'll be your moderator for today. I'm Colleen Robb. I'm a professor of entrepreneurship at Florida Gulf Coast University. And that's a picture of our waterfront beach right there. And uh, students can take the boats out. They just have to sign up. Um, faculty can only come if the students invite them. Um, so that's a little perk that they have on us. Uh, I'm still working on my invitation. <laughs> Um, I'm also a board member of USASB, which is the organization that's hosting this webinar today. And our newly appointed CEO wanted me to tell you just a little bit about the organization in case you're not familiar. Um, so USASB is an inclusive community advancing entrepreneurship education through bold teaching, scholarship, and practice. We're a membership-driven organization known for developing educators and researchers who together build new knowledge, share best practice, and develop entrepreneurial ecosystems within our communities. Um, today's webinar is free, but you can check out our website for social interest groups, mentor programs, and scholars programs that are available to all members at www.usasbe.org. Um, so this is our agenda for today. Um, if you have any questions as we go through, just put them in the chat. And we'll try and get to all of those questions in the last 15 minutes that we have together. Um, so just put those questions in the chat and I'll be keeping track of those as we move into our Q&A. Um, so we've assembled a panel today that um, kind of complements each other in all different ways. They're all gonna tackle a different aspect of these issues that are facing our students. Um, our first panelist is James Zabrowski. And he's currently the executive director for the Collegiate Entrepreneurs Organization. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the organization, but they represent the nation's largest contingency of collegiate entrepreneurs with more than 250 chapters and resources accessible to nearly 16,000 students. Um, James primarily focuses on corporate partnerships, including recruiting relationships for the organization and has a personal background in family small business nonprofit management and the fitness industry. Um, so James is going to discuss some internship opportunities, some student perspectives, as well as review some resume and um, job finding tools that he'll share with you. And we'll send links out to everything after the, the webinar. Um, our second panelist is Dr. Juanita Morris. So Juanita spends time serving as an educator impacting students from kindergarten through college, and she's currently an administrator at Richland Community College, which is in Decatur, Illinois. And there she is an adjunct business and entrepreneurship faculty member and a first generation entrepreneur. Juanita is gonna take um, more of an introspective approach and share some ways that we can communicate with our students in order to help them feel um, encouraged. Uh, about possible entrepreneurial opportunities that are available to them in this situation. And our final panelist is Eric Custer. Eric is a professor of entrepreneurship and innovation at Georgetown University. Uh, he's the founder and the, he's the founder of the Creator Institute and a venture partner for Next Gen Venture Partners. He was recognized as the 2020 National Entrepreneurship Professor of the Year for his work in teaching and coaching hundreds of students from more than 75 colleges and universities in the past two and a half years. Um, this included helping more than 250 students write and public, uh, publish their first books through his Book Creators Program. Um, Eric is gonna do a bit of a deep dive into a particular program that he runs. Um, and I checked out the pro program, it's pretty cool. Um, students actually develop their own apps, their own books, um, they do videos and online courses. Um, maybe he can help out some faculty this summer maybe. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm sure you're done listening to me talk and you wanna hear these three wonderful panelists. So I am going to stop sharing my screen and we will be going in this order. So I will pass it over to James. 
Thank you, Colleen. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, today, I wanted to start with a student perspective. Um, so be that we connect with our chapter leaders most primarily, I reached out to one of my chapter presidents um, that, that contacted me a few weeks ago, essentially informing me that everything that he had planned for this summer um, is now foregone. Um, and it was a big disappointment for him. So I wanted to start with this perspective uh, and, and kind of go through my topic um, along these lines. So this particular student uh, is a high achieving collegiate junior. Uh, uh, he has spent for the last three years um, all through leadership positions within the CEO chapter and the investment club on his campus and has received leadership awards for his participation in those organizations. He's already completed two summer internships and was planning on a third this summer in New York City with a mid-market private equity firm. Um, unfortunately, that program was canceled and he came to us and basically said, you know, it's given me some time to think about what I'm truly passionate on. And when he kind of took a moment and reflected, he realized that his true skill set is finance, uh, but his real passion is helping people and entrepreneurship. Um, and so that really got me thinking along the lines of how a student can use this time if they had planned for an internship uh, to consider other areas of exposure and other areas of opportunity. Um, so a good example of that is, is looking at, you know, your mindset in this challenging time and evaluating your resilience. And um, I know Juanita is going to dive into that a little bit deeper, so I'm not going to go so deep into that. Um, but, you know, something to consider for your students is that you're really high performing students. Um, the ones that are involved, the ones that are engaged, the ones that come to you with, you know, new ideas and exciting opportunities are struggling <clears throat> in this time because they've done everything that they're supposed to do and they're following all of the guidelines and the check, the check boxes and uh, they're feeling this sense of rejection um, from, you know, companies that, you know, would otherwise really be salivating at the mouth to get them into their program. Um, so it's, it's an interesting time for everybody, but for our students in particular. So what I looked at was all of the resources that we provide and the connections that we have and put together a few tools that I think will be helpful uh, to both uh, collegiate students as well as faculty members um, in terms of evaluating and guiding them to excel in this interesting dynamic time. Um, so the first point that I wanted to talk about was a career center that CEO developed uh, in partnership with our membership management program. Uh, the career center is jobs.c-e-o.org. And this career center provides internship opportunities, entry level positions, and innovative career options for both students and professionals, specifically in innovation and entrepreneurial related companies and positions. Um, it does provide access to job posters, so you can actually view the individual that's posted the job and you can view the different company profiles. Uh, we found that this is a really great tool for entrepreneurial minded students um, that are interested in innovative opportunities and corporations love it as well because they're able to connect with this specific mindset. Um, a lot of corporations like Enterprise, Dell, GE, have always been known for innovation and entrepreneurship in their own rights. Um, so it's a great opportunity to explore these options for students. Within that career center is a really unique tool called Resume Review. It's a free resume review with a live career services agent. Um, this is a one-on-one -on -one engagement in which the student meets with the agent one-on-one -on -one, uh, via a Zoom call much like this today. They review their resume and they that individual makes suggestions. And so these are not partners of CEO. These are professional live agents that service other association organizations. And some of those organizations include the Association for Talent Development, the Society for Human Resource Management, 
the American Academy of Physicians Assistants and various business and professional associations. Uh, we found that by uploading your resume to Resume Review, it also allows corporate partners of CEO to review your resume and identify if you're somebody that they would be interested in hiring. Uh, it's a great way to kind of keep yourself on the market while you're in a position. And going back to my student's story, that was one of his biggest challenges, was that because financial uh, positions and internships require so much lead time, he turned down all of his other opportunities and now those other opportunities are full. Um, so he's, he's really kind of in a, a tricky spot. Now, if for our students and professionals that are not necessarily focused specifically on entrepreneurial roles, LinkedIn has a really unique feature called Career Alert. Um, so you can actually set specific keyword searches like entry level, internship, innovation, uh, and you can actually view the date that the position was posted. I found that this is a really unique and helpful tool during this time because a lot of companies that end up posting on LinkedIn have had their positions open for some time and are still looking to fill that position and they just haven't found the right fit. So LinkedIn does allow for that easy apply um, and it's a really great way uh, for students to quickly demonstrate what they have available to them um, and, and review uh, the different positions that um, are currently available. Um, so then I looked and I dug a little bit deeper into, into who is actually hiring right now. Um, and I found a lot of our corporate partners are, but we've, there's also a massive listing online um, of the different types of positions. So I wanted to feature just a few companies here um, that I think would be pretty applicable to some of the students in your classes. Um, Instacart is looking to hire 300,000 employees over the next few months. Amazon, 175,000 in fulfillment centers. CVS, close to 50,000 through various capacities, including social media and sales. And then a full listing like Kroger, Target, PepsiCo, Lockheed Martin, Salesforce, DocuSign, FedEx, and Walmart are all seeking to hire more than 20,000 employees. Um, so yes, and I see there is a question here. Some of these positions are virtual. Um, they are all being filled as a result and response to the outbreak. Um, so this is something that students, I think, would be able to um, consider. And it is not specific to uh, career-focused uh, opportunities. Um, so, you know, something that I always encourage our students to think about is that as an entrepreneur, you have to have your, um, your eyes and ears always open and kind of keeping that opportunity recognition mindset top of mind. Um, something to consider is that while you might not have any passion or interest in working for CVS or Amazon or FedEx or Kroger, chances are you're going to learn quite a bit about that industry or that corporation. And by working for them, a student is able to look at it from a different perspective and say, hey, this is something that there's a serious void in this business process, or there's an opportunity for us to build a business and create a solution for this company. Um, we actually had a student several years ago go through our full program. Um, he was what I would classify as a really engaged, higher performing student, and he immediately left to take a corporate position at Southwest Airlines. Um, as soon as he got to Southwest, he quickly realized that there was a serious void in that industry and in in that market and he's created a business solution for Southwest. Um, so after he left the company, he was able to sell his business implementation to them um, and continue his entrepreneurial dreams and ventures. So uh, that was uh, something that I found to be quite interesting. And back to the uh, kind of skills mindset topic, um, we have a speaker, he came to our global conference last year and he stayed very engaged and involved with the network. His name is Chris Culver. He's a serial entrepreneur. He's launched 15 different companies and he also acts as a corporate executive coach. And he's recently paired his knowledge of, of corporate leadership and his entrepreneurial experiences into one uh, workbook series, which he's made available to the CEO network. Um, this is called the Life Balance Wheel and the Aspiring Solo Entrepreneur. 
So a student or a professional would be able to go to uh, aspiring, and I know the link's going to be put in the chat, but aspiringsolopreneur.com slash life hyphen balance hyphen wheel. And by completing this wheel, you'll receive an evaluation on your spiritual, mental, and physical health, as well as your focus on talent, treasure, time, and resources. And as it relates to your professional life, job satisfaction, compensation, environments, and when it relates to relationships, partner, family, and friends. So the reason why I included this is because oftentimes I'll connect with an entrepreneur or a student and we'll realize, or you'll ask them the question and essentially say, well, what do you want to be doing five years from now? And a lot of times they cannot answer that question. It's a real, it really stumps them and is challenging for them to respond. Uh, but what they don't realize is that, that they can paint a very clear picture of what they want to do professionals in networking engagements or um, just with associations are more than willing to help a student reach that end goal. Um, so being able to have a concrete evaluation of who you are and who you want to be and areas that you want to improve upon is a really great visual in this time of, let's say, less than doing everything that we want to do. Um, so being able to explore these opportunities and really kind of view yourself um, in this introspective way is helpful for a student. So you'll be able to go through that balance tool wheel. And once it provides you with the PDF, you can then go back to the homepage, which is aspiringsolopreneur.com. And that homepage provides a wide variety of workbooks, uh, video series, and you, there's actually a book that you can read as well. Um, so I highly recommend this. It's something that I've gone through. Um, it's helped me really kind of figure out how I can connect all of my passions to what I really want to be doing in this challenging time. And I think that as students are more so challenged to find internships and positions this summer, they can use this as a test of their resilience uh, to be an entrepreneur. How capable are they of identifying their passions and building a venture in the unknown? Uh, so those were the topics I wanted to cover and thank you for having me here today. Thank you so much, James, that was great. Um, and it's a nice segue into what Juanita is going to talk about. Um, so again, she's going to take more of a introspective kind of approach and, and help students um, really think about their lives entrepreneurially and consider options that may not be what they expected. So Juanita, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I love listening to James because I feel like we're saying the exact same thing just maybe in a slightly modified way. I was taking notes through his, his portion of this discussion. Um, for me, serving as not only a first-gen entrepreneur, but also as a faculty member and an administrator and an educator, here, here is the goal for our students. And, and I teach this, and not only do I teach it, but I also live it. If the intent is to live a life that is absolutely amazing as you want it to be, you have to be an entrepreneur. You know why? Because you have to create that life. Um, so the entire experience of this life is really an exercise in our entrepreneurship. And it's just a different take on um, how we live. And those things, as James mentioned, are our passions. And notice that he mentioned passions plural and not passions, passions singular, because a lot of times people think that you only do one thing. And the truth of the matter is that we were designed to do multiple things, but maybe not all at one time. And so here is what we know for sure. We know for sure that we're in an economic downturn. We also know, those of us who are a little older, especially faculty um, and, and staff, we also know that this will present itself again, but maybe in a different manner. And so when we talk to our students, one of the things that's important is what companies were founded during the downturn of the last economic recession in 2008? If you go back and you look at when Instagram was founded, if you look at when Uber was founded, if you look at when Slack was founded and when Square was founded, those things were twirling and coming into existence as we exited the last economic downturn. 
That is so very important because one of the things that James mentioned in his segment is that there are so many companies that are hiring massive amounts of people. Our economy is not closed which means that we have to be open if our students have lost internships to different exercises and different experiences. Here is the other piece to this. It is not about the position, but it is about the skill set that is required for the position. You take your skills and our students take their skills with them. You may not stay at a position very long. You may not get a position, but when you get it, the question is, what are the skills that I can draw from this experience while I'm here? Um, because that is what will take you um, forward into your, into your next one. Um, so here, he, he, <laughs> whether you're going back to work, going back to class, whether you're deciding to start a business, one of the things that you have to do is that our students have to try something. In order to try something, you've got to do something. I think sometimes we feel like if we cannot and our students can't solve the problem of COVID-19, that is called a gravity problem. We will not solve a gravity problem, but maybe we solve the little bits and pieces that are in our community and in our locus of control. We have to focus on those things that give us the ability to operate in a function of flow. And what is flow? Flow is that thing that you do naturally that um, gives you um, the vibe that, okay, I can do this. Your work and the work that our students seek should help them to find their flow. My flow is education. It doesn't mean that I have to be a teacher. It doesn't mean that I have to be a faculty member. It means that I am at my best when I feel as though I am educating and helping to inform people and students. So our students have to find our, their flow, which is those passion items. What continues to move you and move our students forward? So here are a couple of things because it is so important. I believe a couple of things. And one of those is who you are, what you do, and what you believe, they have to be in alignment. When they are not in alignment, we struggle against finding the flow, the passion, and the purpose of what we've been designed to, to, to do. So who you are, what you believe, and what you do, make sure that our students find time to explore those things, especially as internships may be taken off the table, especially as opportunities may be removed, especially if other opportunities are presented to themselves and they don't look quite like what we thought they should, encourage our students to be open enough to receive other experiences. So a couple of ideas, identify and write down the skills for our students. Write down what's the thing that you do well. What's your jam? What's your flow? When you are doing that thing, that you are in a constant state of engagement. What is that? Or what are those things? Because those are the transferable things that will take you from position to position to entrepreneurship to building the life that you design or that our students desire. Identify and write down what gives you that and why it is so. The other thing that I think that our students also need to do is this idea that you have 24 hours. And so for me, my students, you have 24 bucks, $24. How do you spend those? Because I believe that when you figure out what your flow is, those are the things that you should be actively engaged in, which means that is where you spend your time. So our students are always busy. I know my students are terribly, horribly, awfully busy all the time. But when we write down how we spend the 24 bucks, we are wasting a lot of time, which is really the great equalizer in terms of resources. So how are we spending our 24 bucks? How are we spending our time? How are we spending our most valuable resource? It is so very important to acknowledge what we are putting in is the things that we get out. And if we don't put a lot in, then we're not gonna get a lot out. Um, write down for our students the vision for your life. It may change, it may evolve, it may become something different, but when you have a vision and when our students have a vision, that gives them something to look forward to. It gives us something to work towards. Write down the vision for your life. Write down between two and four goals, not 100, not 50, not 75. Write down two to four goals for 2020. 
My husband and I have an exercise. We write down two financial goals each year. It focuses our spending for the entire duration of 12 months. We do the same thing in our personal and professional life. What are the two to four things that we want to experience personally and professionally for the year? Because that is where our energy goes, which means that is where I should spend my most valuable resource and my most valuable asset, which is my time, which also tells me that I can control and create the outcome that I desire. Um, if you're planning for today, which is what I share with my students, you are totally behind. Even when circumstances change, even when we don't expect this thing that we are living in now, if I am just now starting to plan and see my future, I am behind. So help our students to put a plan before them. It only is a guide. It is not permanent. It is not set in stone. But put a plan before them because then you're able to pivot and to shift. There are so many ways to get to Florida. You may drive, you may fly, you may bike, you may hike, however it is, but without a plan, we will arrive at different locations, different places at different times. So allow our students to have and to create a tentative plan um, for what is to come. Because if today arrives, and I'm just now looking at today, um, I, I am well, well behind. I'll leave with this. I do believe that what I do and who I am and what I believe are in alignment. It does not mean that you have to operate in one center of, um, in one industry. As James mentioned, you may work at, um, at Kroger, you may work at Amazon, you may work at um, any other company. We run a lawn service company, we run a food company and we also run a school supply company. The skill set across the different companies are still needed, even though the services and the outcomes are not. So help our students to be open to experience other spaces and really acknowledge um, the, the skill set, not only that they have, but the one that they want to develop too. And so it is a mindset shift. It is a different level of understanding. And it is a shift in saying that even though things are going not terribly well right now, really there's space and the economy is still open. And please explore those things that don't look like what we traditionally think that they should. All right, thank you so much, Juanita. That was fantastic. Um, I feel motivated now to go get all my things done. <laughs> um, all right, so now we're going to pass the torch over to Eric, who's gonna do a bit of a deep dive into what he um, is called the Portfolio Expansion Project. And it's a five month summer program for students that maybe don't have internships or the internships don't really fit in with, with what they wanna do. Um, and then I think we might have enough time for uh, a little bit of a discussion around the research you've done around crisis grads, which yeah. is pretty fascinating um, yeah. and timely. So I will pass it over to you. Well, thank you. Um, and first off, I think uh, I'm glad so many people are on this. I think it's one of those things that our students are, I mean, I've had uh, probably a dozen conversations in the last week of students who've had jobs or internships canceled. So I think it's a real thing and they call us. Um, so I thought the first thing I want to do is sort of help with one of the things that I've seen is really powerful right now is the reframe. And I think what's going on right now is sort of one of the things that I wanted to research, and I think Juanita sort of brought this up, is there's been a bunch of really interesting companies that came out of the last crisis. Our students, it's really nice to hear that Instagram came out of this one, but how does that help me? And so what I oftentimes do for people is tell them is I spent a bunch of time understanding uh, and studying the graduates who came out of the last recession. So the 2008, 2009 period. So I went on and studied the Forbes 30 under 30. These are people that made it and looked at what they did in the 2008, 2009 timeframe. This is really powerful for our students because they freak out thinking, oh my God, I don't have a brand name internship on the resume anymore. They're really nervous about it. But here's the interesting thing. When we looked at it and sort of understand what we call these crisis grads, what they did, they approached things very differently. And this is where the reframe on internships really, really matter. The brand name of your internship is much less important than what you produced where you were at. So 
want to make this really crisp to people is that it doesn't matter how brilliant the name is, if it's a really respected company or not. If you didn't produce anything that you can show to your employer, they don't care anymore. And I want to say that really clearly is that I think a lot of students get really nervous thinking, hey, I worked at Goldman Sachs, I worked at Google, this means I'm set up. And what the research showed when we looked at the people who graduated in 2008 to 2010 is that it didn't matter where they did something, it mattered what they did. It didn't matter what school they went to, what graduate school, what it is. So the first most important thing to understand is to help our students reframe what this summer is about you're not going to get the internship at the brand name you wanted, or you may get somewhere somewhere else. But the important thing to understand is that you need to understand that this goal of this summer is about putting something in your portfolio that employers for the next decade can look at. And that's really the biggest thing that we understood is that crisis grads don't have the benefit of always prestige companies on their resume, but they have a different advantage. And that is they can build their portfolio from things they create that they can show. Now, one of the things that we studied when we understood these crisis grads, what they did differently, is we identified that there were nine different types of what we call creation events that they did. They had these entrepreneurial experiences that were really, really interesting um, that they did. These people, because they didn't have the great internship, they may have spent their summer out there putting together a book. They may have spent their summer doing an audio podcast season. They may have spent their summertime going out there and producing some kind of a concert or an event. What was interesting about it is that they created things that they could put on their resume that were personal, that were substantive, and that were unique. And so that's the most important thing that I've learned is that we need to focus our energy not on helping them capture an internship, but capturing an experience that helps them put something in their portfolio. Because really oftentimes our students get freaked out about the idea of is this a prestigious internship or not? But the reality is if in your internship you don't produce something that you can put in your resume, this certainly will not help you any further than that. And so I think that's the biggest important thing that I would sort of say. So I'll tell you a really quick interesting story that happened to me. And so over the past three years, I've had a really weird random experience where I was teaching an entrepreneurship class. It wasn't particularly fulfilling. And so I decided to do something different. I decided to force my students to create something they could put in their portfolio. And that was really the class that I started teaching three years ago, um, where I forced all of the students in this class to write and publish a book. And over the last three years, more than 250 of my students have gone on to publish books. And it has been wildly crazy to sort of see how this has opened doors for them. But the fundamental core of this one is that it's a focusing on helping them expand their portfolio. And that's the real goal here. Whether your internship is prestigious or not, are you doing something that expands your portfolio? And so what happened a couple months ago or a couple weeks ago was if you follow anything on LinkedIn, is that our students began to act long before we did. Um, if you actually follow any of the threads, there's been students' threads where they've been gathering names of other students who've been displaced, lost internships. Um, there's about six or seven of them. They have thousands, tens of thousands of names who are basically trying to support one another. Them. So a group of students reached out to me and said, hey, Professor Custer, we know you do this sort of book thing, um, would you be willing to sort of work with us at all? And so I began working with a group of students um, to help them sort of create a way for students to sort of support one another. And we called this idea the PEP Fellowship. And the idea behind this one is we want to give students an opportunity who don't have the internship they want or don't have an internship to do something that helps expand their portfolio. So the PEP stands for Portfolio Expansion Project. We want them to work on something substantive that by the end of the summer, they have something that they can show to employers. Here's the biggest pitch behind all of it. You want to spend the next five to 15 months working on something that employers in 2021 will use to hire you. So 2020 is done. Like it's over. We just have to recognize this period is stressful and over. You can't do anything about it. So instead, focus on focusing on something you can do. And so that's where this idea of a pet fellowship came to be, is that we've opened up an opportunity to build a community support community that's helping, helping individuals focus on one of four different tracks we're helping them on. Um, for individuals who are creative students who say are having trouble getting jobs in journalism or English, we're gonna help them go through a community-based program to create their first creative book, a fiction work, a memoir, a novel, and that way. The second group is business students or students who are interested in technology. Well, if they can't get a, a job in a company they want, they could write a book, exploring a new industry, understanding how augmented reality will change sports or what may have you. So maybe instead of creating uh, you know, something that you would do at work, why don't you create and publish a book or an audio show, some way to go out and kind of create your own podcast where you can interview people and build this one. Or the last one is to create a video course. 
this is the simple idea that we've decided to do is help people have a structured five month experience where they get together weekly, they have individual support, they have partnerships, they have accountability and mentors. And so that's really what the idea of the PEP fellowship is, is to help people disentangle the fact that you have the name of the company and the project you produce. And so if the companies go away or you don't have them one, do you have a project that coming into the 2021 summer that you can hand to any employer and say, I did something amazing? And why do I know this works? Because I've had dozens and dozens of students who told me, I applied for a job that only accepts MBAs. I don't have an MBA, but I did give them a copy of my book and I've gotten hired. And so the important thing to understand here is particularly for our students who are focusing in innovative careers, companies that are innovative, they don't care about the prestige of the college you went to anymore. They do care about what you did. And so if you do focus on anything this summer, don't worry about how prestigious the company is. Worry about how important the project is for you to be able to demonstrate your purpose, your passion, and your ability to do these great things. So that's really the idea of this one. It is a total accident, but this group of students that came to me has 16,000 students that are getting weekly emails from each other on what they're going to do for the summer. And we hope this idea of this pet fellowship is something that can help people. I think Julian posted the link down there. If your students are looking to do something, it is sort of a community-based experience. Um, there's no cost to do the program. We're going to do our best to do it. I'll be teaching these sorts of tracks over the summer. But the goal is to help someone have a structured way to say, when an employer asks you, so 2020 was kind of weird. What did you spend your time doing? They can look back and said, I finished my first book. I published my first podcast, or I put out a video course. Take a look. And if we do that for our students, we will transform their experience because it's not about where you did something, it's what you did. And I think that's the real secret of helping our students win in this period is helping them prepare for 2021 by doing something that they do on their resume that has their name on it, not someone else's name in that way. All right, fascinating, fascinating. Um, so do we have any questions? We don't have anything structured for the remainder of our time, but we have some time for questions. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. I know we've kind of been answering them along the way. As we're waiting on questions, I do want to point out um, exactly what Eric said and not really point it out, but I think sometimes our students get stuck and the premise of his discussion is, is that our students have to do like you've got to do, and if we can help them to make sure that they don't get stuck by giving them the do in their area, like that is huge. Like that is an enormous experience for our students. So we do have a couple questions coming in. Um, one is, Eric, do you have a citation for your public uh, published research. I don't, but if you reach out to me, I can send the work that I've put together. I haven't published it yet, but I will. It will be coming out soon. Um, and then I guess there's a couple questions on the, um, the, the, and I can give you the underlying research. We studied about 5,000 of the graduates of the Forbes 30 under 30 to understand what they did differently. Fascinating research, by the way, to understand, uh, just quickly to sort of say, it's not the school they went to. It's not that they went to graduate school. It's not even that they started companies in college. It's what things they created while they were in college. Um, substantive things that took them between six and 12 months. So that's the fascinating thing. Um, in terms of like the questions really quickly about the PEP fellowship, it's still open. We're not gonna sort of open up the, or start the fellowship program until the first week of June. So um, this is like an interest form that we have for students to fill out that are interested in it. Um, there's a webinar series that they'll go through in May to help them define the basics of their project. And then for people that have a project that sort of we think looks like a good fit, we'll have them sort of start into that way. And, um, and I, will, I will post my, I think the link is in there, send it to students, again, open to anyone. Um, our goal is to support as many students as possible. We've structured this in a way that is really community powered. So I'll be teaching it. I've got people who are gonna come and help mentor. So we'll have some support on that one, but a lot of it is peer to peer mentorship. And we're doing a lot of those things on that front um, to, to do those sort of ways. So I'll post my email address in here if people need to reach out to me with those questions at all, but certainly um, it's open and certainly happy to help. Great, and we did get a question that came in that said, you talked about your success. Could you talk about what didn't work? Oh, what didn't work for, for, uh, for students? Oh, um, I think, I mean, the biggest thing that I would sort of say that, that didn't work is uh, there, there is a lot of, I guess I would say there's a lot of prestige porn out there where it's like, I, you know, I work at this fancy name company or whatever it might be. I think that's the biggest thing that we found didn't work. So looking at the Forbes 30 under 30, um, people often assume that you go to great schools or go graduate schools. 
only about 15% of people that make those lists went to a top 10 school. Um, more people on those lists drop out of college than went to graduate school, right? So, and, and so I think the important thing to understand here is that I guess what I would say is my hope out of this whole entire thing a little bit is that for students that are ambitious, that have these aims, that they do realize, to Juani's point, it's a do economy these days. It's not a where you did economy, right? It's not a resume. And so I tell people a lot, like you should focus on building your portfolio, not your resume. A resume is a list of places you did things. A portfolio is the examples of what you did. And so as I've hired people, I've hired probably thousands of people in my startups. I don't care what school you went to. In fact, if you talk about what school you went to a lot, I actually am less likely to hire you. I care about what you did there. And I think that's the broader thing uh, in that way. So sorry. <laughs> um, and then we did get a, a quick detail question on the, the PEP program. Are there any requirements for signing up? So the idea is simple, like they sign up at this form, you can see it probably takes them five to 10 minutes, but the goal of it is to express their interest, what they wanna do in it. And then coming out of that session will actually, or that, that application or sort of interest form, um, we'll give everyone access to a webinar to put together a plan for the summer. So to Juanita's point, you have to have a map. And so what we try and do with people is take them through a one hour webinar to understand what they wanna do, what they wanna accomplish with this project. And then again, individuals that submit a plan that they wanna work on, we will kind of guide them through a five month process with weekly sessions, with accountability partners and a project through there. Again, the goal is to help people, you know, again, release their podcast in 2021, publish their book in 2021, put their video course in 2021. So that's really the goal is these are not things that are, you're gonna flip a light switch and solve tomorrow. But we do think that in 2021, these are portfolio expansion projects that will happen. Um, and so again, there's a guided process from, here's what my interests are, let's help you figure out the specifics and put your plan in and then execute on that starting in June. Great. Um, and I think this question is actually for all the panelists. Um, for students who have the privilege to have remote internships and are fortunate enough to have some income in the summer, is it better to invest or save that money? I'm doing some financial advising here. <laughs> I don't know if any panelists have any feelings or thoughts on that. No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, think this, I, I would say it this way. I do think one of the things I studied in the Forbes 30 to 30 is that people were willing to invest in themselves. And so I, I will say this, and this is maybe counter to the fact that I'm a faculty member, is I don't suggest, unless you're going to be taking classes over the summer to graduate early, I don't suggest that more classes will replace your internship. So just to be clear on that one, I think there is this tendency of like, and this is sort of schools are pushing this one. Oh, take a bunch of classes. It's really great. Unless you're going to graduate early, it's a lot of money to invest in more classes. It will not make you any different. I would say though, spend money on a project, like go to a code academy and learn an, a program in the summer, but I would invest money in actually building a project in that way. If I were to give sense of it, again, people who did make the Forbes 30 to 30 list, they invested in projects that help themselves. That doesn't mean these are free things, like, but you do invest in an editor or in someone to be an app coach or the developer, stuff like that. But I think it's investing in projects, not in sort of more sort of credentialing, I guess. All right, we have a question for Juanita specifically. Any advice for best ways to execute action plan after mapping out your path? Uh, I think, <laughs> so I don't know if this is going to be a direct or indirect answer, but here's the thing, like it has to be true to you, right? And so a lot of times we take in a ton of external information from other people, what mom thinks is best, what grandma thinks is best, what the people who are paying for your education may think is best. The idea is to, to find the flow that's inside of you right? The idea is to do exactly what Eric and what James has said is that invest in developing that thing that is going to put you in that space where it feels natural, even though it may not be easy. The idea is to be sincerely open and honest with yourself. Because what I found is, is that when you're open and honest with yourself, then it probably looks and feels crazy. Now is a great time for it to look and feel crazy because we're in a, a look and feel crazy kind of time. But if it's given to you, honor that hold on to it before you release it and then nurture it and help it grow. So when you put it out, don't expect for it to be um, 
lockstep and linear. There are ebbs and flows in life. There's ebbs and flows, but the idea about experiences is so important. Be open to experiences that may or may not look like they directly relate to what the plan is, because oftentimes it is in those spaces that look and feel unfamiliar that the next path comes. So put it out, leave it out, revisit it, but start to do as both have said, start to execute, start to look for opportunities to feed your flow. I don't know if that's a direct answer or not, though. <laughs> uh, we have a question actually from a graduating senior. Um, they're considering grad school instead of starting a career because of the current state of the job market. Do you have thoughts on pursuing grad school right after completing an undergrad? I'll, I'll give a quick answer. So I wrote a blog post on this one. I, I think what I would tell you is um, the best and most important thing you can do is, uh, is two things. Number one, know the math. So what is the math that you're going to see when you invest in graduate school? Because it's an expensive endeavor. And if you don't understand how it's going to level you up to get you the place you want to go, it's the ROI on it can be very, very poor. I mean, again, understand when you put forth $100,000, is it going to pay off and what thing and what's gonna to happen to it? That's number one. Number two, I always think that there's this fallacy of people believe that they need graduate school to get permission to do what they wanna do. And so this fallacy exists where they say, if I get graduates to this graduate school, I will get promoted. And so what I always tell people to do is go out and interview people, like put the entrepreneurial skills to work to sort of see people who have not gotten the graduate degree and got the job you want, the industry you want and see what they did. I think graduate school can be great, but I do think that we sort of build up this prerequisite in our head that we need this to sort of do something. And I don't always think that's the case. Um, like for example, if you wanna be a lawyer, yeah, like it's pretty obvious, you better go to graduate school and get a law degree. But if you wanna be someone who's in, you know, doing something else, you wanna be a manager promoted, look around you and sort of see are other managers having MBAs or graduate school degrees and understand what are the paths to get there. I will go back to this and I'll say it again, cause I harp on this all the time. People believe that the credentials in the graduate school unlocks opportunities. But remember, the biggest thing today, and employers are saying this time and time again, that it's not where you did something, it's what you did. And so if you go to graduate school and you're able to produce something, again, I would tell people about graduate school, like look at things like General Assembly today, where you actually produce things for your portfolio, look at other types of things you can do that one, or heck, just take six months off and produce something on your own might work. This is not an anti-graduate school thing, but it is a sort of empower and own it to make sure that you know what's the ROI on it and what's the outcome that it's going to get you. And if it's going to get you those things, that's the best, most efficient way to get there, then yeehaw, do it. But if you don't have an answer to those two questions, go get them. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that, that are, those are all the questions that have come in. Um, we will def we're gonna get a lot of questions about the links and contact information and things of that sort. So we're gonna put that all in one nice, beautiful email and send that out to everyone that attended it. Um, and I believe Julie, the CEO of uh, USASB, this organization, said that this link will also be on YouTube. So if you wanna share that with any colleagues, feel free to do that, it'll be openly available. Um, and I want to thank our panelists. This was really, really a useful and inspiring session, much more than I thought it would be. So I appreciate your time. Um, thank you, everyone, and um, stay safe. Oh,